Hello everyone. This presentation will be on the schematic approach to a clinical examination of the central nervous system. The slides are made available by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and it's available online as a part of the IAP UG teaching module 2015-16. After taking a detailed history, when we come to a central nervous system examination, we'll examine under the following headings of higher functions, cranial nerves, motor system, reflexes, sensory system, cerebellar signs, followed by skull and spine and the meningeal signs. Now we'll go in that order and we'll discuss the examination of each of these in one by one manner. Now coming to the higher functions for a small child, we can assess the higher functions merely by checking whether the child is alert, active, playful and whether the child is able to recognize the mother and strangers. In an older child, we can assess the consciousness, the orientation in time and place, the intelligence, the memory and the speech. So it distinguishes between a small child and an older child but the ultimate aim is to ensure whether the in higher functions of the child are intact or not. Coming to cranial nerve examination, there are 12 cranial nerves and each of them is to be tested separately. For the olfactory nerve, that is the olfactory nerve is responsible for the sense of smell. So because it is responsible for the sense of smell, to assess the sense of smell in the child, we use oil of clove or peppermint and test each nostril separately. So if this is the nostril of the child, first close one nostril and keep the item on the opposite nostril which is kept open and ask the child to try to assess and preferably use an alternate method. So if you use peppermint for the left, try to use asafoetida to the right and test each nostril separately. You can also use some balms but sometimes olfactory assessment is difficult in a young child. So sometimes we can just see whether the child is able to perceive the smell or not. Moving on to the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, we assess in the form of visual acuity, field of vision, color vision and the fundus. When we see visual acuity in a younger age group, we just use a torch or a bright toy and try to engage the child by looking at wall pictures. If the child is more than 6 years of age, you can go for a Snellens chart or finger counting. This is for long distance vision. Ideal vision should be 6 by 6, that is a vision of 6 meters is visible at a distance of 6 meters. Apart from that, we can also use Jager's chart in an older child where you try to check near vision. This is distant vision and Jager's chart is meant for near vision. Color vision assesses the three primary colors, red, green and blue and this test can be done in a child who is more than 3 years of age. And visual field is tested by perimetry by finger confrontation test in an older child and in a younger child merely by moving a light or a toy and trying to bring it into the field of vision of the child. Apart from this, the pupils of the child are to be assessed to check the size, shape and reflexes to check for the direct consensual and accommodation reflex. Now normal response is if light is shown on a pupil, if light is put upon the pupil, the pupil will dilate, will constrict. And if light is reduced, that is brought into darkness, the accommodation reflex ensures that there is a dilation. So it's easy to remember, we all know that when light comes upon us, it takes some accommodation as a result of which the pupil tries to constrict. So constriction occurs when light is shown, that is a direct accommodation reflex. So if we have two eyes, the left and the right, and light is shown upon the left eye, constriction of the left pupil is a direct reflex. And consensual is the pupil dilates even on the right side as the consensual accommodation reflex. Third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves are often tested together because they all involve the extraocular muscles. Now we need to distinguish three key points. One is ptosis, nystagmus and squint. Ptosis is basically drooping of the eyelids. It is affected because of movement of the eye. We have to test in all the directions and sometimes a comatose patient will have doll's eye movement. As far as nystagmus is concerned, nystagmus is a jerky movement of the eyeball and it's often because of a cerebellar lesion. No, nystagmus is classified into horizontal and vertical. So if the jerky movement goes in a horizontal manner, it's known as horizontal. If it goes in a vertical manner, it's known as vertical. And as far as squint is concerned, it's further subclassified into paralytic, non-paralytic. That is paralytic or non-paralytic is also known as concomitant. Squint is where there is an apparent error in the axis of the eyeball. So even though the child appears to be looking in the straight ahead position, the eyeball is tilted to one particular side. That is a squint. 
A paralytic squint is where the range of the eye movements is impaired and a non-paralytic eye movement is where the, there is, the vision is defective but the range is normal. In paralytic, the range is impaired and vision is normal. That is a key point to keep in mind. We know that there are four extraocular uh, muscles which are recti and two oblique. Apart from it, there is levator palpebrae superioris. So collectively, there are seven extraocular muscles. Superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique and inferior oblique. And we all know that superior oblique is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve and lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. The others are supplied by the third cranial nerve. Now, if we come to the testing, the superior rectus is involved in looking laterally upwards, inferior rectus for laterally downwards, lateral rectus for looking laterally, medial rectus for looking medially, inferior oblique for medially upwards and superior oblique for medially downwards. Now, the fifth, that is the trigeminal nerve has different components of motor and sensory. The motor component is assessed by asking the child to clench the teeth and palpating over the cheek and the temple to check for the contraction of the masseter and temporalis muscle. Apart from that, we ask to open the mouth wide and the jaw deviates to the paralyzed side in case of a pterygoid paralysis. Sensory uh, component is assessed by assessing the sensations over the forehead, cheeks and chin, which is subdivided into three regions of ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular. Now, we all know that the ophthalmic part supplies the first part, maxillary the second, and the mandibular, the third part, schematically to show. Now, coming to the facial nerve, the motor component enables the wrinkling of the forehead in view of the frontalis muscle, the use of orbicularis oculi to try to open tight closed eyes, obliteration of the nasolabial fold on the paralyzed side, and looking for deviation of the angle of mouth and assessing for buccinator by asking the child to try to blow air. Apart from that, the sensory component is assessed by checking the taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. We know that the anterior two-third is supplied by the facial nerve through called a tympani branch. Now, to distinguish between a lower motor neuron lesion and an upper motor neuron lesion, an upper motor neuron lesion will affect only the lower half of the face because the upper half has bilateral cortical innervation. And a lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve results in a complete lack of facial movements on the side of affection. We know that about Bell's phenomenon that is, is seen only in a lower motor neuron lesion where when the child attempts to close his or her eyes, the eyeball will roll upwards. This is very characteristic and is an important MCQ. Now coming to the vestibulocochlear nerve, uh, it's basically involved with the auditory component. So we need to do a detailed hearing assessment. Simple way to do it is audiometry or a watch test if a full ENT facility is available. Apart from that, you can go for a Rennie's test or a Weber's test. By Rennie's test, we try to compare whether air conduction and bone conduction are normal in the child. So keeping a high frequency tuning fork, you first check for the air conduction and then check for bone conduction. Normal response is bone conduction is better than air conduction. Weber's test ensures for laterality, so you keep the tuning fork upon the glabella or the vertex of the child and see that it is heard equally. Now, if you want to assess the vestibular component, you need to do the Romberg's test and uh, assess for vertigo or nystagmus upon head movement by Hall Pike's maneuver. Ninth and 10th cranial nerves can be assessed together by checking for uh, nasal regurgitation of fluids and nasal twang of voice. If affection is there, there will be nasal regurgitation of fluid. Apart from that, the position of the uvula is normally central but it will move to the normal side if there is a palsy of the vagus nerve. Palatal movement is generally pulled to the normal side if there is an impairment and collectively both the ninth and 10th cranial nerve contribute towards sensory aspect of the posterior one third of the tongue. We, so to just revise, the anterior two thirds is supplied by the facial nerve, the posterior one third is supplied by the vagus and the glossopharyngeal. Apart from that, you can also look for bulbar palsy and pseudobulbar palsy. Bulbar palsy is characterized by a lower motor neuron lesion of nerves originating from the medulla where there is no jaw jerk or gag reflex and there will be pooling of secretions. Whereas a pseudobulbar palsy will have exaggerated jaw jerk and gag reflex with signs of uh, pyramidal signs and 
small spastic tongue. Now coming to the spinal accessory nerve, we assess it based on the trapezius muscle and sternomastoid. Trapezius is checked by the drooping of the shoulder on the paralyzed side and scapula drop to the lower level. And sternomastoid is assessed by asking the child to turn the head to one side or the other against resistance and checking for the prominence of the border of the sternocleomastoid. The final cranial nerve which we assess is the hypoglossal nerve. For assessing the hypoglossal nerve, we ask the child to protrude the tongue and it deviates to the paralyzed side. Fasciculations will be seen in Werning Hoffman disease and atrophy is generally seen on lower motor neuron palsy of the hypoglossal nerve. Now, when we assess the motor system in detail, we check for the bulk of the muscle, the tone, the power, coordination and presence of any involuntary movements, if any. Tone is nothing but the resistance offered by the muscle to passive stretching. Hypotonia is seen in lower motor neuron lesion or in spinal shock. Whereas hypertonia is seen in either spasticity or rigidity. Spasticity is where there is a pyramidal tract involvement and there is unequal involvement of the gravity and anti-gravity muscles. Whereas rigidity is because of extra pyramidal involvement and uniformly increased in both the agonist and the antagonist muscle groups. We check for muscle tone under the headings of inspection, palpation, passive movements in the shake test. And in small infants, it's checked based on different angles and the position of the child based on the adductor angle, the popliteal angle and the dorsiflexion angles. We grade power from 0 to 5 in various joints, namely the neck, shoulder, elbow, wrist, intercostal muscles, diaphragm, abdomen, hip, knee and ankle. Among these, what we commonly assess are the elbow, wrist, hip, knee and ankle generally. Grade 0 is a complete absence of movements. Grade 1 is flickering or feeble movement. Grade 2 is enabling movement by eliminating gravity. Grade 3 by doing it against gravity. Grade 4 against partial resistance. And grade 5 being a full strength. So if I say a power is 5 by 5, it means that the child has a full power. Now coming to coordination movements. Coordination movements are done based on finger nose test and knee heel test in an older child. And in a smaller child can be indirectly assessed by asking the child to close a pen cap or by opening a chocolate wrapper. It's important to note that we test the coordination movements only if the power is more than grade 3 by 5. Coming to the involuntary movements, the involuntary movements uh, can be classified as tremors, fasciculation, fibrillation, chorea, athetosis and dystonia. Tremors can be further subclassified into fine or coarse. A coarse tremor is an intention tremor whereas a fine tremor can be seen in hyperthyroidism or anxiety. Fasciculations are seen in because of a muscle bundle as a whole and fibrillations are because of single muscle fibers. Chorea are defined as semi-purposive and sudden jerky movements which is seen in rheumatic heart disease. And athetosis are slow rhythm movements which can also be seen in rheumatic heart disease. Dystonia is because of sustained muscle contraction in abnormal postures. Now, moving on to reflexes, we classify reflexes into superficial and deep tendon reflexes. The superficial reflexes include the corneal or the conjunctival reflex, which is because of the sensory components of the 5th and the 7th cranial nerves. The abdominal reflex is because of the joint involvement of T6 to T12 spinal segments. So, we stroke the abdominal wall from the lateral to medial side. And a common mistake what is done while assessing is, we must stroke it in this manner. So that is the correct way of stroking for the abdominal reflex. Chromasteric reflex is done by stroking the medial aspect of the thigh which results in the upward pulling of the scrotum. Anal reflex is assessed for S3 and S4 by stroking the perianal region. The plantar reflex is assessed by L5 and S1 by stroking the lateral aspect of the sole. And a normal response is generally because of plantar flexion of the big toe. So, this is also known as a Babinski sign. So, if to just demonstrate this, generally stroke with the back of the knee hammer or with a key. The normal response is a plantar flexion of the big toe and fanning of the other toes and dorsiflexion of the big toe suggesting a Babinski sign positive. So, the normal response is plantar flexion. But if there is extension or dorsiflexion, it is because of a upper motor neuron lesion, 
but it's important to note that this Babinski sign will be present up to one year of age. The reason being there is incomplete myelination at that time. Now coming to the deep tendon reflexes, the biceps jerk is assessed based on C5 and C6 components and with the child's arm in a semi-flex position as seen in the image with the arm resting on the examiner's arm, the strike is kept over the examiner's thumb which is kept over the biceps tendon and checked for the presence of the need of the biceps jerk. Supinator jerk is assessed with the arm in the same position as the biceps jerk but the strike is over the styloid process of the radius to result in supination of the forearm. Triceps jerk is assessed for C6 and C7 with the elbow flexed to 90 degree with the wrist placed over the patient's chest. After striking the triceps tendon above the olecranon, we observe for the extension of the elbow. Jaw jerk is kept by placing the examiner's index finger on the patient's lower jaw and striking and an exaggerated reflex indicates a lesion above the pons. Now, knee jerk can be done in two aspects. One is in a sitting posture and one in a supine posture. In a supine posture, it's important to flex the knee to almost 120 degree angle after which the knee rests upon the examiner's left palm. The patellar tendon is felt and the examiner strikes exactly over the patellar tendon watching for the extension of the knee joint. In a sitting posture, it's important to ensure that the patient is able to sit with a free dangling to check for the extension of the knee. The knee must not support over the ground. The knee jerk assesses for L2, L3 and L4 spinal components. Coming to ankle jerk, it's important to keep the lower limb everted on the bed with a slight extension at the knee joint and with the left hand of the examiner placed under the sole to support, dorsiflexing the fo uh, foot to a 90 degree angle. The aim of this is to ensure that there is a stretch at the tendo Achilles tendon to result in a strike over the tendon resulting in the contraction of the calf muscle. To assess the response to all these, we should understand what a clonus is. Clonus is nothing but a repetitive rhythmic contraction of a muscle evoked by a stretch stimulus. Ankle clonus is by assessed by flexing the patient's knee slightly and supporting the propylateal fossa. Sudden dorsiflexion of the forefoot with the right hand while supporting the knee with the left hand will result in a sustained clonic contraction. Similarly, a patellar clonus is assessed by pushing the patella towards the foot resulting in a series of contractions of the quadriceps muscle. These are physiological clonuses, what we observe for. To grade a deep tendon reflex, uh, we grade it from grade 0 to grade 4. Grade 0 is an absence of the reflex. Grade 1 is sluggish, which is present only with reinforcement by a gender 6 maneuver. Grade 2 can be readily elicited like a normal ankle jerk. Grade 3 is brisk like a normal knee jerk. And grade 4 is a clonus. Now, coming to primitive reflexes, uh, these primitive reflexes are present in the neonatal period and generally are lost before acquiring new functions. They generally disappear by three months and rarely last up to one year of life and it's important to do the primitive reflexes in a case of developmental delay. The, just to name the primitive reflexes, what we assess for morose, rooting, sucking and grasp reflex apart from asymmetric tonic neck reflex. The final component what we check for in the major headings are the sensory nervous system. The sensory system is assessed based on touch, pain, temperature, vibration, stereognosis and position. It's important to note that we can assess pain only more than 3 years of age. So touch we further subclassify into fine touch and crude touch. Crude touch we can do based on tactile localization and discrimination. And light touch is done by a wisp of cotton. To assess pain we do based on the pinprick method and temperature is assessed with test tubes of hot and cold water. The vibration sense is assessed based on a 128 Hz uh, tuning fork which is applied over the skin upon a bony prominence and asked whether the patient is able to feel the vibration and to compare with that of the examiner. The fundamental assumption for this test is that the examiner has a normal sensory system. Apart from this, stereognosis is aiming to recognize the size, shape, weight and form of common objects such as a coin and pencil but again it requires a minimum of a 5 year old child to do a stereognostic test. Apart from that, joint position sense is also important to assess. Now coming to the cerebellar signs, uh, like I mentioned earlier, nystagmus is generally gaze evoked. Dysarthria is accompanied by staccato speech. Head nodding is uh, seen in titubation. 
Intention tremors can be diagnosed based on the finger nose test and pass pointing is an inability to stop intended movement at the correct place that is also known as dysmetria. This dialogokinesia test is inability to carry out rapidly alternating movements in a back and forth manner and there are various abnormalities which can be seen because of the gait. Uh, so seen as examination is incomplete without checking for the meningeal signs. Classically, the three signs what we look for are neck stiffness, Brzezinski sign and Koenig sign. In uh, Brzezinski neck sign, you aim to put the chin of the child towards the sternum. If the child is not able to complete that maneuver, it is a Brzezinski positive. For a Koenig sign, you try to ensure that there is a flexion at the knee joint followed by flexion at the hip joint which results in a sustained pain if meningitis is present. Now finally to come to the last aspect that is the examination of the skull and the spine. McEwen sign is also known as a crackpot sign. This is seen in a suture separation due to raised intracranial tension or in a carotid brui. And a presence of hydrocephalus will result in transillumination positive at the skull level. A gibbous dimple or tuft of hair is always to be examined in a newborn especially to rule out any spinal abnormalities and to ensure that the shape of the spine is normal because that's the easiest way to pick up a neural tube defect. On that note, I thank you for listening to this presentation of a rapid review of examination of the CNS. Uh, I thank IAP for ensuring that the slides are made available online and I hope you tune into the next video also.